Let's take a look at a couple here. Okay, two kinds of problems I want to look at, then I think we're good. Uh, one of these is a something like this. Okay. So you got a couple like this to look at on the uh, assignments, and you'll see at least one of these on the test. This is kind of a weighted. I don't want to say this. There's a. It, when well, we're trying to, to in this case, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of a weighted quantity. Uh, so certain, like in this case, we're looking at building this tank that has to enclose a fixed volume. And what we know here is that the end cap, so the, the tank is like, it looks like a pill or like a capsule, right? It's got hemispherical end caps joined with a tube. So think like, a, like an Advil caplet or something like that, right? Uh, if we drew a picture, you get the idea. Something kind of like that, right? Okay, so the end caps, though, cost three times as much per unit area as the two part does. Okay, and so we're supposed to find the dimensions that minimize cost. So what, what I mean by weighted is when you've got this kind of a situation where, where part of it costs more than the rest, for example. Or there's going to be, I know there's going to be one you're going to see, I, I think it's on the homework, um, where they want you to minimize the time it takes to go from one place to another. And the guy can travel, thanks. he can travel over land for part of the while and he can only go a certain distance over the cross country goes along the river and it's a little faster and so you know it's it's something like that where you're doing a, a, a weighted average sort of type of thing okay so think about that for a second what what are we thinking is gonna is gonna happen with that the entire time I was thinking of like an actual like fire tank and I was like I thought, oh, like actually, yeah. like a water tank. Like a war tank? Yeah. Like super nice. Oh, I got you. <laughs> so I got you. I was like, how the hell do you get it? Like, yeah. Just because I was farted. I'm like, where's the I don't think so. <laughs> it's, a, it's an underwater tank. Wow. So, where do we start? <laughs> What are the dimensions of this thing, I guess? What are the things we can control? For the for that whole thing. For the whole thing, yeah. Or we're no, we're trying to minimize cost. Okay, which may not necessarily mean minimizing surface area. Right? If, if, if this problem were uh, if we were just trying to minimize surface area, anybody have a suggestion what probably would happen? <laughs> yeah. No, I'd say probably the opposite. Probably the tube would just disappear completely. Short and fat. It become the tube would just disappear. It just would become a sphere, right? Well, it says the the hemispherical parts are the parts that are more expensive. Right, right. I mean, if, if you're right. If if it were just, but if, if we weren't paying attention to cost, oh, okay. if we were just minimizing oh, okay. surface area. Mm -hmm. This thing would, would probably degrade to just a sphere, right? Because a sphere is an efficient way to enclose volume. But what's going to happen here is it's going to get stretched out a little bit, isn't it? Because the, the spherical parts, the hemispherical parts, are the ones that are expensive, right? So it's going to be, there's going to be happy medium, though. We don't want to get too long and skinny because then it doesn't enclose the area or the volume very efficiently, right? And so somewhere in there, the math gods are going to decide on an answer. So what are going to be the, the quantities, well, what are the variables here that define the shape? Height or radius. Okay, good. So the radius would be just like that, right? And that's the radius of both the, obviously, the caps and the two. And then we just need a height, and that's right there. Okay, so what do we get for our primary equation then? This is the part that's probably a little bit weird to you. 
Okay, the five is the five thousand going to be the primary equation? That's our constraint, isn't it? Right. So that's got to be the secondary equation. Well, what is what is the quantity that we're trying to minimize or maximize? What? Cost. Okay. So how about if we break the cost up into two parts? Break the cost up into the the two hemispheres combined just make a sphere, right? So we can do the cost of the sphere, and then the cost of the cylindrical tube. I see. Okay. Okay. So what's going to be the cost of the, let's do the tube? How are we going to do that? What's going to be the area of the tube? Remember, do you know do you know what the lateral area of a cylinder is? No. Okay, here's how here's here's how you can find it. This is a good little trick. If you were to, if we just take the tube, what would happen if I cut that tube and unrolled it? What would it look like? A rectangle. rectangle. Look like a rectangle. Okay. Well, the rectangle is just length times width, right? Okay. What well, what would the what would the width of the rectangle be? The circumference. Circumference. Yeah. What would the other dimension be? Hi. Hi. Yeah. So then, isn't it just two pi r h? Oh. 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 <laughs> So there's, now that's the area part, but that's not the cost, right? The cost, what about the cost? Okay, but the, we're just doing the tube now, then we'll add them up to get the total cost, right? What are we going to say? How much How much do, does the material cost per unit area? Does it say? No. So what would we call it then? It doesn't say. We could call it x, but x is usually a variable. And is it going to be a variable? It's a constant, right? So, and x would be fine. It's a good idea. But why don't we call it like k or something? Usually, and this is just this is one of those things in math. There's certain variable or certain symbols that usually we assign for variables, and certain symbols that we assign for constants. And usually, like k and c would be would be things that we reserve for constants. I don't know why. I guess because they both say like constant. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's going to be. Something like that, right? Does that seem, does that bother you? Because we don't know what K is. Yeah. K is Kendall. Okay. I, that's, I, I can see where that might be a little bit troubling because we don't know, we, we, we don't really have a, a definite function there. We just have it in terms of, of K, where K is the cost per unit area for the tube part, right? Now, what's going to be the cost, the, the total cost of the caps? <coughs> So what's the what's the area of both hemispheres combined? Did you say four the area of a sphere? Yeah. So good. So four thirds pi r cubed. Whoops. Okay. Got two r's in there. Why did I do that? Pi r cubed times what? Three. K. Three k. Three k. Uh huh. Why? Okay. Why are those three? Why are we all the volumes? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Yeah. Why are we? Good question. We shouldn't, should we? Why don't we use surface area? Well, we're I don't know. Four pi r squared times three k. Much better. There we go. Wait, why is it three k? Okay, because, because it says that the hemispherical ends cost three times as much per unit area as the tube, right? Oh. So if the tube is cost cost k dollars per square foot or whatever we're measuring this in, then the the end caps must cost three times that. Okay. Gotcha. So now is the start. Maybe it's okay we're using these k's, right? Because yeah. all we really needed them for was just to relate the relative costs here. So then the total, if we simplify this, what's our total cost function going to be? Just yeah, add those up, right? So I'm going to get two. Whoops. Two k pi r h plus 12 pi k r squared. Okay, how many independent variables there? Two, yeah, r and h, right? Okay, so what we need an equation of constraint then, don't we? Yeah. So what's, what's that going to be? 5,000. 5,000, what is that? The volume. The volume, okay. So then, what's the combined volume going to be of this whole thing? Uh, the, the sphere and then plus the... Okay.
Okay, sphere plus the cylinder, right? Okay, well, what's the volume of the sphere? That's my four thirds. There's our four thirds, pi r cubed plus. Now, what's the volume of the cylinder? Okay, there's, there's another little trick for this that makes it kind of easy. Whenever you're calculating volumes of prisms or cylinders or things of that nature, think what that means. That means you're taking this, you're going to take this flat end cap that's a circle, right? And you're just going to extrude that through space to carve out the volume. So whenever you do that, all it ever is, is just the cross-sectional area times the distance you're moving it through space to carve out the area, right? So what's that going to be then? What's the cross-sectional area? Pi R squared. Pi R squared, yeah, good. Pi R squared, and then we'll move it vertically, H, to create the volume. E. Okay. Okay, and that equals 5,000. Good. Okay, so now what? Yeah, okay, good. So now we have to make a decision. Which variable are we going to solve for here? R. H. What's the consensus? More on the H side. That's a very wise choice. Why is H such a good choice and R such a bad choice? R squared and R squared. Yes, okay, good. We have a lot, just all kinds of problems with the R. Look at the R. It shows up. It's to the first power here. It's squared there. It's squared there. It's cubed there. I mean, first of all, how are we going to solve for R down here in the first place? It's going to be a mess. We, we don't want to do it. And if we did, There'd be multiple solutions. We'd have to discard a bunch. Then I'd have to plug it in in multiple places. This mess. H would be easy. H, H is linear and shows up once in each function, right? Each quantity. So that's an easy one. All right, so we'll solve for H. And if we solve for H, what are we going to get? Mm. <laughs> uh, 5,000 minus. 5,000 minus. One of the super problems we had, like, <laughs> All over fire square. There you go. Okay, kind of a mess, but that's all right. So there's our substitution variable. We've got to plug that in right there. Right. So this is going to start to get big and ugly. <coughs> <laughs> so what variable is going to be left over if we're substituting for H? R. R. So we're going to get C of R, right? R is our independent variable, equals 2K pi R times that mass, right? So when I do that, let's go ahead and try to simplify this a little bit. What's going to, any cancellation? Yeah, the pi's are going to cancel, right? And, and one of the R's will cancel. Good. Make sense? So we'll end it. Would you agree we end up with from our first term 2k divided by, or times, sorry, times the numerator up here, 5,000 minus 4 thirds pi r cubed divided by, and then what did we get on the bottom? The pi's canceled. We just got an r, didn't we? Is that right? That's fantastic. Okay. Plus. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Okay. Right? And we cancel that with that. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so now what? Well, we could. Are we going to get any like terms here? Yeah, we are, aren't we? So we might as well. How about if we add those up? Right? We might as well combine like terms. So if I distribute this common denominator to both parts, and these things get kind of ugly, don't they? But you just got to you just gotta be careful. You have to be careful with the algebra. If you're careful, things just work out. That's my issue. I don't like being careful. Get it all screwed up. So first term is going to be, what, 2? 
So we, we actually, let's simplify this completely. So 2K times 5,000 is just 10,000 K? Yeah. 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 Okay. Wow. 10,000 K over R, right? Absolutely. Okay, then we're going to get, now this is going to get a little ugly here. We're going to get minus 8 thirds pi R squared, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we better show these okay. steps. Minus, if I distribute, you write yes. 8 <coughs> thirds pi wow. R squared. K. Is, it, is there chaos on K? Because the R, right? Makes sense. Why are we putting K first? No, but it, it's a constant, so it just go before the variable. Oh, okay. Plus R twelve pi K R squared. So those are like terms, aren't they? Okay. So we end up then with what? Oh, that's cool. So we get. 10,000 K over R <coughs> plus how many we, we got to get a common denominator how many thirds is 12 36 36 so 36 thirds that minus 8 thirds of that would be 20 yeah 28 thirds oh yeah I'm seeing it I'm seeing it Okay. What? Oh, you forgot a zero on the thousand. I did. Oh, okay. Right. I, was, yeah. I stopped yeah. when all of a sudden when I saw it. I was like, I don't remember. I was like, Ooh. there's no R in alpha slide. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It could be the numerator or separate. It makes no difference. Okay, so I'm going to put this on the next page. We need to. Hi, B. Oh, he's going to copy this. Yeah, yeah, it could be either in or out. Is this, is this, this is like my sixth. <laughs> okay, so now let's take a look at our domain, right? We've got we just really need to do calculus now. We need the domain, and then we'll find our critical numbers and just and work down on this thing. Okay, so we're looking for values of R, and we want to think about this mathematically and in terms of the actual shape. So mathematically, what's the domain? Zero. Okay, meaning, what about zero? Like, just greater than zero. Okay, well, it just couldn't be zero mathematically. Yeah. Mathematically, it could be negative, but physically, it can't be negative, can it? It's a radius, it's a distance. Right. Distances are always positive. So our lower limit, it has to be greater than zero. Uh, what about the upper limit? We know that, that the volume has to be 5,000 cubic feet. So think about this a little bit then. If R is going to increase, what's happening to H? It's going to decrease, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Because this the, the volume this encloses is fixed. So either it's going to be a long, skinny pill, or when we start to close this thing down and the radius gets bigger, the height is going to shrink. Up until what's going to be the logical limit of that? Until the height is zero, right? At some point, the height will just disappear, and we'll end up with a sphere. And then we can't tweak it any more than that. Then, right then, it just we're stuck. That's that's the biggest that the radius could be is when it becomes a sphere with a volume of five thousand, right? So. Remember how we can think about that. A lot of times it's easier to think about, instead of trying to figure out what is going to be the maximum value of R, you know that the maximum value of R is going to occur when H is zero. And so we could even just look right here and say, okay, well, how's that going to be zero? What's the value of R that's going to make H zero? What would have to happen? How, when's a fraction equal to zero? When the top is zero, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so we'd have to just set the top equal to zero, and that's going to be the upper limit. So that would just be when 4 thirds pi r cubed equals 5,000, right? Yeah. Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, why don't we get our own little page just for finding the upper limit? Let me grab that, and then we'll... Yeah, we're doing
Okay, so if we said then, if we said four thirds pi r cubed equal to five thousand, because that's when the top goes to zero, uh, we just what? Just multiply by three fourths. So what do we get? Thirty seven fifty or something like that. Is that right? So. R cubed equals 3750 <laughs> over. Did I do that right? I think I did. Yes, you did. Okay. <clears throat> over pi. And so it's just going to be the cube root of that. Uh, right? <laughs> so that's just some number. That's our upper limit. Okay. What is that as a decimal, real quick, somebody? That's a decimal. <laughs> oh, let's guess. Let's guess. Okay. Five. Seventeen. Right. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Twenty-five. Six zero seven eight four four one eight. What is it? Ten point. Oh, well, so ten point six zero. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Point six one. So we'll just, you know, we'll we'll just approximate that then in our. Yeah, whatever. Oops. <clears throat> Those are like big Remember, it can't be zero, so we got to have a rounded lower limit, open lower limit, up to ten point six ish, right? Okay. So now we'll just do our calculus, right? Okay. What's the first derivative? First term. Is it going to be positive or negative? Yeah, because I have an r to the minus 1, don't I? Yeah. So let's do this one first. Because k is a constant. It's going to be 56. Okay, 56 thirds, because we're going to multiply by the 2, right? 56 thirds pi k r, right? Are you with me? Yeah. Okay? Yes. Minus, because that's an r to the minus 1. 10,000 K R to what power? Mm -hmm. Negative 2. Right? <coughs> Make sense? Okay, so where is that? We've got to find the critical numbers. So where do we look for critical numbers? The zeros, good. We want the zeros of the derivative. And undefined. And undefined. Now, where would it be undefined? No. It's zero. Is zero in our domain? Nope, it's not, right? And the reason it's zero is because we already had an R on the bottom there, right? We had a discontinuity in the function that the derivative just inherited. So every successive derivative is always going to get that, that R in the bottom, right? So then let's see, where is this equal to zero? That's what we need to find. So C prime equals zero when, what could I do? If, imagine this whole thing said equal to zero. How would you solve an equation like this? Factoring. I mean, we could go about factoring it. That's a possibility. <laughs> now, what's, I, I want you to kind of see a little bit of a look here, though, that's, that's handy. Let's, let's write this out. So this is when 56 pi k r over 3 equals, if this is all equal to zero, right? Um, Okay, I've got these two ratios, right? I've got an R on the bottom in this one and on the top in this one, right? Good. Okay, do you, you see that we could we could add this term to the other side and cross multiply? And then all the R's end up on the top. I see, I see. Right? And then we get an equation maybe we can factor, right? Okay. So if we add this to the other side, that just becomes an equal sign. Right? We can cross multiply. If we cross multiply, we get 56 pi k r cubed equals 30,000 k. Okay, now what's what can we do with that? Divide by no. Yeah, divide by what? K. Yeah. Okay, that's it. That's kind of important. I know there's a lot. This is this is a this is a big time problem. But that's
that's a big deal. When the K's cancel, that's the math god's way of telling us that the actual value of K was irrelevant. And, and shouldn't that be the case? If you go back to the original problem, now don't lose track of this, guys. This is in the original problem. All it said was that, that the hemispherical ends cost three times as much. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the, if the tube part costs $10 per square foot or $1,000 per square foot. If you're trying to minimize the total cost, all that matters is that the end caps cost three times as much. And so logically, we should expect that to happen. We should expect the case to drop out when we do the calculus because it doesn't matter. And isn't it cool that it just, I just think it math is so cool that it does that stuff. Like, like you're, you'd expect it to. They go away. They should and they do. Yeah. What happened to the three in the bottom? I, I cross multiplied. Okay. So the k's go away. And then all I really have to do here is just solve, say, a cube root, right? So I end up with my one critical number being when r cubed equals, we can simplify this a little bit. Let's see, um, 56. So that's going to be what, 28. And that's 15,000. So then I can do that again. Four goes into that. Just four, four must go into that. So this becomes a, you know, I'm just whittling this down. So that's a seven. Four goes into that. How many times? Three. And then I'd have how much left over? So I'd have 3,750 3, over seven. What is it? 3,750? Yeah, over seven. There we go. Okay. And I don't think seven goes into that, does it? Nope. Okay, so that's my answer. R cubed equals 3,750 over 7. What about the pi? With a pi on the bottom. Okay. Good. Yeah. What about K? K's cancel. K's cancel. K's cancel. Yeah. Why did you handle the K with one? K wasn't important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's just some number, right? And that's smaller, that, that is on our domain, isn't it? Right? We could make it a decimal if we wanted to, but that's, that's going to be just some number that's going to give us an, a, you know, an accurate reading of the radius. Do you think that's going to be a solution? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, well, we'll talk about that. Okay, this, this is our one critical number. Looks like it could be. Looks like it could be, okay. There's our one critical number. Do we want to take a second derivative here? Yeah, I know. Okay, I would say, why not? That's what I thought. Let's do it. Okay. But yeah. why not? And, and you don't even really have to do the second derivative. If we can avoid the work, that's great. What's gonna? Let me ask you this. You don't even have to do the work on this. When I do a second derivative, the coefficient. Well, the first term is going to be just be a positive constant, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Okay. What's going to happen to the second term? It's going to be positive. Ah. Okay. It's going to become a positive coefficient of one over r cubed, right? Yeah. My point being that for any real positive value of r, what's the sign of the second derivative guaranteed to be? It's going to be positive, isn't it? Right? All we know, we don't even really care what it is. We just know that the second derivative is going to equal some positive constant, right? Plus some positive number over r cubed, right? So C of R is, in other words, positive for every value in our domain, isn't it? Right? So we don't even really have to do the math. We can just see it's got to be that way. Yep. Okay, so then. So our domain, we said, went from 0 up to about. 10.6-ish, right? And our critical number was, well, what is that as a decimal? Let's just take it out to two places. Uh, <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Seven-ish? Oh, so, so roughly 5.5 5. 
5.54 gives us a zero of the first derivative, gives us a positive second derivative, right? So we get a horizontal tangent and a happy function. So it is a minimum, right? And so we, we got, I mean, that's it, right? Yes. We got R, we have an exact answer. All we have to do is plug it in, right? We got R, we can approximate it if we want to. We could go back to our boxed substitution equation, plug that in, get H, right? And we got the dimensions. That's pretty cool if we can do that. Wait, yes. did you get the 5.54? Uh, when we, we, uh, we just plug that into our calculator. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's just kind of hard to write. So we just made it a, you know, probably all we need to do is get this thing to a certain tolerance anyway. Uh, now, let me ask you this. How could we have probably just finessed our way through this and said, that has to be a solution. How could we have, is there a way we could do that? There, there, is, a, there is a way. There's a way we could say, we don't even have to do the calculus on this. Because of the nature of the function, if there is a critical number, it has to be a maximum. Why would that be? Let's, let's, I'll give you a hint. What would the volume be when, well, excuse me, what, what would this, uh, maybe, maybe this is a bad one to do this one. So, <laughs> well, this is probably a bad one to do this one. What, what would the surface area be if R were zero? Or the cost. It would be, you know, I'll pick a different one to do this logic on. This is going to be a tough one. We will, uh, let's skip this. Forget that. Yeah. Okay, never mind. We'll come back to that one. Okay, so, but we got it. We got it. So, the answer is we never actually, I mean, we didn't figure out what the, what the height was, but the, the radius we got to be 5.54 ish, right? Feet, I guess, is what we're measuring this in. Okay. And so we plug that back in, and our calculators would tell us what the height is. Right? Make sense? Yeah. Do you not do that on your calculators, by the way? Do what? Do you know how to, do you know how to, I should teach you guys how to do a couple of things. How, how would you, okay, here's, here's one thing you can do with this. Do you know how to store variables on your calculator and evaluate expressions? Oh, I got to show you something. This is, this is big. There's a store. Where is the store? Okay, I'll show you something really cool here. Especially if you want to do repetitive, if you want to do repetitive evaluations of an expression. Uh, There's just so much to learn. Isn't there? Oh my gosh. Do you mean with Okay, so here we go. Let's. Okay, so this is H, right? Let's. Let's type in this expression. All that says is H equals. Right. So now on your calculator, you don't ever want to change variables. It's just too hard to do. So we always make our independent variable an X, right? And I want to get rid of these. I want to get rid of those. Okay, so on our calculator then, we've got to put all this stuff in the numerator. So we'd make this, yeah, you can even use the fraction template if you want it. Fraction. But in the numerator, we'd have the quantity 5,000. Oops, that's not 5,000. <laughs> One more. How's that? 5,000 minus 4 thirds times pi times x cubed, okay. right? 
And in the denominator, we need a quantity, right? Because it's more than one thing. If I don't put a quantity there, it's going to just divide that whole thing by pi and then multiply the whole thing by r squared. So I got to ensure that all that stuff stays in the denominator. So we enclose it as a quantity, pi times x squared. Okay. And now if I hit enter, it should look. Okay. Now I give me a number back. How come? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Good. Because I had something stored as x. Exactly. And then it is ten or something like the default. Uh, well, it's whatever I last had in there. Yeah, I, I don't know what the default is, but I've done this on here. So whatever I last was left over with. So all we have to do, if, if we want to, to find out what the height is as a function of... I use the store button. Yeah, we use the store button. And we could even do something like we could go over to our answer, which is right there, right? So let's just evaluate that and store it as x. Okay, so we could do cube root. You know how to do cube roots? Yeah. 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 Easiest way is a one third power. If you actually, if you really want it to look like a cube root, you can go. There's a shortcut. Math four. Math four. Math four. Math four. Yes. There you go. Math four. Now it looks like a cube root. Thirty-seven fifty divided by the quantity seven pi. Right. Enter. And it gives me back 5.545, blah, 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 right? So I'm going to go ahead and store that. So if I hit the store button, it'll store my last answer as text. Store button. S-T-O. Okay. Anybody with me? So it's storing that value as X. I'll hit enter to do that. Now all I have to do, hang on one sec, we're almost done, is go up here to that last expression. To that expression, and then do it again, and grab it, to bring it down to the edit bar, oh, and hit point enter. Three, six. And there it is. Eight. Woo! Let's, let's, go. Go. let's go. That's pretty cool. Let's go. That's awesome. Man. That's great. That is great. <laughs> The advantage of that is you can see the formula then in terms of the variables. 